Welcome to Chew On This. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out faith in Christ and the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on, chew on this with us. How much do I trust Jesus? How much do you trust Jesus? How much? Do you trust him enough to let him prepare you to stand? This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine along with Pastor Robin Bjornsson. And we thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Chew on This. This is week number five in the series of Still Standing. This discussion was had live on Wednesday night, October 13th, here at the Forest Lake campus of Maranatha Church. And it was a little bit of a one-sided conversation because of that question. How, uh, what, uh, what does he, and, and how, and you say what, and he does, and it's what? That is what happens inside my head with the scriptures we're going to be talking about in this episode. I understand a portion, and then there's a gap. <laughs> and uh, are you really saying, Jesus, what I think? Uh, please, Jesus, help my natural brain wrap itself around this supernatural concept of preparation in the spirit. The example that Jesus left and the words that he gave us to boundary our expectations, we'll be discussing those in this episode. We have walked through four other portions, four other topics here in this series. And today we're going to pause and look at this thing that he does for us that prepares us to be able to do what scripture says. And we're going to just walk through, Pastor Robin, this concept of how, how it happened to Jesus, how it, what he's talking about for us that he is the the litmus test for us, if you, if you will, but also some of the things that are in him. So our relationship with this is somewhat different, but not, and what kind of difference, to the point sometimes I think our brain gets tired and we just kind of write it off as this isn't for us, well maybe just isn't for me. And I would like to encourage everyone who is listening to just take whatever popcorn Popcorning happens in your, in your in your brain and in your gut as we go through this, and just let it do that. Because you know, if you have a popcorn popper like Stir Crazy, where you get to watch the popcorn become popcorn from kernel to corn, it actually is a very lively experience. But it is also a very beneficial one if you really like popcorn. So that kind of feeling, I think, could be uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe not. It just might be a thing. But just let it do that and join us like we did last night, sitting there in the, huh, where am I in this? Because this is intriguing. With that, I would like to start with John 1.32. Here is where it all begins, and then it moves through all kinds of things in the Gospel of John, and we bounce into Isaiah, which really nailed me, and then we bounce back into the New Testament, and it's all about this one thing, the preparation in the Spirit. John 1, 32 talks about John the Baptist, and it says, And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit, capital S, talking about the Trinity, the Spirit of God, descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. It didn't just touch him. It didn't just kiss him. It didn't just hug him. It came and it <laughs> on him. Now, it's important to know that it didn't change his natural state of being. Jesus was still 100% man, and we know that because he died. There were Gnostic oh, treatments and, and heresies back in the day that at this point he went from being a human being to a supernatural being, so his, the crucifixion didn't quote-unquote hurt him. And I understand where our heart wants to say that, and we didn't want anyone to suffer like that because it was inhumane and it was horrible abuse. But we don't get to make that kind of stuff up because scripture, <laughs> scripture no, never says that. Scripture never even addresses it that way because in order to be a stand-in sacrifice for our sins so we can have intimacy with God the Father, he definitely had to be alive 
thing, a live human thing with blood rushing through his body. And all that conversation seems so archaic and so complex. And so we're not going to go into that, why that was required. But there was no ontological change. The, the, the metaphysics of his body, he stayed the way he was. He was just like us, a supernatural being inside a natural body casing, living here on this planet without his supernatural godly whatever that is. That was given back to him after his resurrection. But while he was down here on this planet, the dude is like us. He's, he's this. But there is a difference because he still is 100% God. How does that look when you, you put it out in a scientific equation? Here it is. Here's the answer. I don't know. But I know this. When the Spirit came upon him in the river when John was baptizing him and that Spirit remained there, it did not change him into something uh, something that you would put on, you know, the Marvel comic show, you know, the movie. He, he's not a Marvel comic character after this. He is still the same. He has access to this thing that he talks about quite a bit, especially in the last year of his life when he's spending most of his time with the disciples. So it didn't change his physical nature, and it didn't change his spiritual nature. It did something else. It added something to him. It put something in him. It made a connection of some. So here are some of the, the scriptures that talk about that it didn't change his spiritual nature. These are things that are talked about of Jesus. Here in John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That was who Jesus was before he came here on this planet. That piece of him is still there and gets reunited with him when he goes back into heaven and sits with God the Father. So how did it change for him to come down here? I don't know. There is just this understanding of what Jesus did after the Holy Spirit sat upon him in the river, <laughs> isn't just for what he did. So the part of him that was the same is still the same, and we know that he is 100% God, but what part of that operated here on the planet? I don't know the percentage, but I do know this, that what he's offering us, the experience that he talks about, he is very adamant about us having access to this. So let's go through these verses, and he became flesh in John 1, 14, and the word became flesh, and so well, what did that mean? I don't know, the supernatural thing, this weirdness of it all, and I know it takes faith to go through this, and there aren't going to be the one plus one equals two, because we don't even know the elements of what that supernatural equation is. We do get to live in some of the product of this, and we do get to touch some of it here and now. And the word became flesh and actually dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. Glory as the only son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus testifies to this, if you can't believe in me as the Messiah, then believe the works that I do, that knowing that this is what God has prophesied of old and is now being fulfilled. Not only does the Spirit remain on Jesus, as it says in John 1, 32 and 33, like we read John 1, 32 already, that it came and it remained on him. I'm just gonna read it over again. And John bore witness in 1, 32, I saw the Spirit, descend on him like a dove, and it remained on him. And then it goes into verse 33. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me, God spoke to John the Baptist and said, when you see the Spirit come down in the form of a dove and remain, that is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. That is the Messiah. So John was prepared. <clears throat> he doesn't say how long he waited for this. But he, he knew that in his preparation of what he would, in his obedience to the Lord and fulfilling what his life was designed to do, that he was going to have this experience. How long did he anticipate? How often did he go, could it be this? Oh, it certainly can't be this person. Because he's human. These things have to go through his head. So we know that this, the spirit remains on Jesus, but he also empowers Jesus to speak in John 3, 34. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. So the Spirit in Jesus gave him, empowered him to speak the word of God. Jesus, speaking by the Spirit, speaks words of words that are spirit and are life, according to John 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And when the Spirit comes, we know he's going to glorify Jesus. And this is accomplished by his ministry to the world and to believers. John 16, 12 through 14. We're almost done with these here. 
And I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, when he comes, all right? Jesus is talking about some weird stuff. They were used to that. So when we read it, it sounds weird. We should be used to it. Well, he's going to do this thing. He's going to guide you into all truth. He doesn't speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So he is hearing from God the Father, and he's hearing from Jesus in heaven. I mean, however the supernatural trinity works. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. So he, he gives you foreknowledge. And he will glorify me. He always glorifies Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. He reminds us of, the, of what Jesus says, and he emphasizes Jesus' teachings, and he is part of Jesus. Their character is the same, however they are connected. And we know that Jesus baptizes by the Spirit. John baptizes by water. So all of these things are talking about the Holy Spirit, some of them about things that were in Christ before, some of the things that happened after he was baptized, some of the things that are there that he's offering to us. And it's all there, and it's in a great big jumble in a basket, and go ahead and try and make sense of it, Pastor Robin. Exactly. That feeling of, what did you just say? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night, go access my notes. <laughs> go ahead and, and, and read them and let them kind of go, I don't get this, that is exactly the situation. That is why, how much do I trust Jesus? He is talking a lot about this, it's everywhere. It is everywhere in the Gospels, it's everywhere in the New Testament, this concept of the Holy Spirit and what he does. So who, who is Jesus gonna baptize with the Holy Spirit? If John the Baptist baptized people who were repenting, in, in water to be ready for the Messiah, and he's going to baptize with water. So who, pray tell, is Jesus going to baptize with the Holy Spirit? Because Scripture uses this phraseology. This isn't just Pentecostal phraseology. This is New Testament phraseology. So just who is he going to do that to or for or with? And so here comes the Scriptures that kind of give me a wonderful headache because I don't like it when I don't have a complete puzzle done in my head. When I'm thinking through the, these things and there seems to be a gap here, I don't like that because trying to explain this to someone else gets really complicated when you say, I don't know a lot. It's like, I don't quite understand how this works, but we need to, once again, how much do I trust Jesus? All right, so here we go. So obviously he's going to be baptizing human beings with the Holy Spirit. Okay. <laughs> So, John 14, yay, John, 11 through 13. Now remember, John the Apostle is, in my opinion, Jesus is his very best earthly friend. He's seen things and navigated things that were just a little bit different. Part of it, I think, if my understanding is correct, that he was, if not the youngest, one of the youngest disciples in the group. So obviously, you follow the, the, the ones that are older, especially in this uh, Middle Eastern society, an Eastern society like this. So maybe he had the opportunity by being quiet and helping a lot that he's seen things. So I love all of these verses connected to the Holy Spirit and Jesus that, J that John is writing about. It's like, I don't want you to miss this, because I know that this, this is extremely important for what's coming next, and that would be us. So in John 14, 11 and 13, it says this, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on accounts of the works themselves. Jesus is saying, hey, believe that I am the Messiah, or believe these works. Believe that God the Father is in me, and I am in or believe the miracles that are going on around here. Truly, truly, here we go, verse 12 of John 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And here's where we pause, and I will share it with our listening audience, and I will look at you. When is the last time you prayed for someone who was dead to rise up from the dead? And wow, they did. Because this is that miracle that got everything to expedite to the end of Jesus' earthly life when he raised Lazarus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lazarus was resurrected from the dead, also helping them understand when Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was going to happen. They weren't all aghast because it was the first time that it happened. He raised other people from the dead, but Lazarus was in the tomb for that decay time where you can't open it because he's going to stink. You can't you can't recreate body matter. I mean, when someone is dead and they're there and they've only, they just died or, or died within hours and you come, people are thinking, well, maybe they really weren't dead. Well, the exclamation point was put here, um, Lazarus was dead, dead. Mm -hmm. 
and the whole town knew it because they were prominent citizens and all of that. So you will also do the works that I do. Well, now, Pastor Orlean, you can't mean that. It's like, I got to tell you, there aren't these little addendums that say it depends on how magnificent you are or how committed you are or this is only for G. It doesn't, Jesus does not say these are things that only I can do because I'm so special. 100% God and 100% man. It, it, this isn't what it says. He specifically says as he's talking towards the end of his preparation time, helping his disciples and his those, the apostles and the disciples, the ones that are hanging on through all the weirdness. If they had to hang on through weirdness, why do we think we don't? <laughs> that we got to be able to understand it all. I don't get all of this, but that freaks me out. Because when you study the miracles that he did, they're freaky. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, I have never prayed for a dead person to rise. I have prayed for plenty of sick, pe sick people. Mm -hmm. And some have gotten better and some have not. Mm -hmm. So he goes on. He doesn't s stop there. Then he goes on to say this really, Pastor Robin, this crazy thing. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. So not only what the Holy Spirit helped Jesus do, there's going to be greater works that he's going to help people do because Jesus is going to the Father. Whoever you ask, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So Jesus is telling us that the believers that come after him that are walking, that he baptizes with the Holy Spirit, they're going to be able to do the works that he did. But then there's going to be greater works that are accomplished through these vessels that are submissive, submitted to Christ. And the Holy Spirit's going to do some things that are greater than what, and I don't understand what that would be. Because raising someone from the dead is kind of like at the top of my freak out level of what. So I can't measure. But Jesus says he needs to go to the Father for this to happen. There has to be a supernatural equation that says this natural earth that we live in now cannot hold Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity can't have two, two things here at the same time. All right. Let's freak out some more. John 14, 15 through 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I'm going to ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. And he'll be with you forever. E even... The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. This goes to people who believe in God, believe in Jesus. But, but you know him because he dwells with you. Doesn't stop there. And it says, and will be in you. So there is. He's with, but he will be in. Something is going to be happening. All right. What happens to Jesus in the water when the spirit remained on him? How can Jesus be the baptizer of the of the whole, how can he send the Spirit and be the baptizer with the Spirit? Where John baptized with water, so Jesus takes the Spirit and <laughs> kind of like Ghostbusters, you get slimed with it. <laughs> All right, I tell you, my brain wigs out on this. John 15, 26, and 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I'll send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, so he proceeds through the Father. Jesus gives us to it, baptizes us, and we get slimed with the Spirit. He will bear witness about me. That's his job. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But also, you're going to bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So he's talking to the disciples there. You're going to bear witness about all this stuff because you've been with me from the beginning. But the Holy Spirit doing this, he bears witness about Jesus. Our job is to bear witness what he's telling us. So we get to get in on this amazing, lovely equation. Yay, Pastor O, that we get to bear witness. The Holy Spirit is there. It's a natural occurrence, like breathing for him. Look what Jesus can do. Have faith. And the Holy Spirit is all messed up in the supernatural living that we do here on this natural planet. But I'd rather not notice it because I can't understand all of it. Okay. So now we get into, those are the verses that just bounced around in my head. Give you some, they give you a little bit of a boundary, a little bit of direction. It's freaky stuff. Jesus does talk about it a lot. John makes sure he lists all of it because that was John's job. He wrote, had that book, the, the experience to write the book of Revelation. That was his first writing. And then I'm not sure where 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John came in this process, but they asked him the disciples, the organizational structure, they asked him to write his memories of, to add to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so when he read those letters, which I'm sure he knew them very well because he was part of the church at Ephesus, my understanding is that he, 
after Jesus gave him his mother to watch over and to make sure she remained safe to be her caretaker, if you will, knowing that it was going to get messy and ugly and she would be somebody, a someone that people would want to hurt and do things. So that's my understanding of it. He, he took Mary, but he went to Ephesus and the church that started there, extra biblical sources say that this is where Mary died and this is where John died, and John died somewhere in his about 120, if I remember correctly. So he's there, there's a long life here. So somewhere in this span, and I have read it, but I have forgotten the timeline of it, when he writes the Gospel of John, he's specifically making sure that this does not get forgotten, and he emphasizes it in such a way, especially this stuff at the end when he's preparing the disciples to live without him in the natural state. He's still there via the supernatural, but he can't be physically here, but the Holy Spirit can be, realizing what the Holy Spirit can do. He's coming in such an enormous way. Things are going to be messy. And so we get to John 16, five through 15. The work of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's see. But now I'm going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking me where I'm going because you're grieving, it says in verse 6. Instead, you grieve because of what I told you that I'm going away. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the Advocate, capital A, individual person, won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin. It's naturally in his character to, to, to show the difference between holiness and sin, righteousness and sin, and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. And they're all looking at him with the deer in the headlights looks, okay? And then he says in verse 12, there's so much more I want to tell you, but I can't do it because you can't handle it. You can't bear it now. So how in the world is he going to communicate what he wants to tell them? He goes on to explain how it's going to happen. When the spirit of truth comes, he's going to guide you in all truth. Underline, guide. He will not speak on his own accord, but he'll tell you what he has heard. He's going to speak to you and tell you. So he's not going to just guide, he's going to speak and tell you. Underline that. And he will tell you about the future. He's going to let you know prophetic things. Underline that. And he will bring Jesus glory. He'll bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. Jesus is going to be able to speak to us through the Holy Spirit. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. So we see the inner workings of the Trinity that don't and should not make sense because there is nothing in the physical realm that can match it. You can try to wrap your head around other things that exist in three parts but are one unit. And they are not that. But we can try. But it's interesting to note that the baptism in the Holy Ghost isn't what changes us. It is the power of the ascended Christ coming into our lives by the Holy Ghost that changes us. It is Jesus' power coming through this conduit of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not an experience apart from Jesus Christ. It is the evidence of Jesus Christ. Jesus is telling us, this is part of me. It's not the separate little thing I give you. This is part of me. He is with you, but he will be in you. That should bother us. Can I wrap my head around wanting the in and not just with? Do we get all, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But it's not, it's not there as a extra something to make us super Christians. It's not like that. I mean, the Holy Spirit is in you because he wants more of Jesus in us. And that's hard, and Jesus knows because of our humanity we're going to need help. We need an accessible store to go get things from that helps our spiritual nature grow and be strong. We need and right, I am rambling, trying to wrap my head around this. I hope your brain is doing the very same thing. And yes, you're welcome. You are so <laughs> welcome, because it doesn't stop there. John 1, once again, it says the whole spirit came down in the form of a dove, and it remained on Jesus. It didn't just sit on him. It didn't. 
It didn't poop on his shoulder. It didn't do anything like that because it's a bird. You're saying this bird sit on him. What do you know? But John knows what's going on because the, the Lord told him. All right. So here, it isn't just there. I have to wonder if John and eventually Paul, because we're going to read something out of Ephesians, if John thought about this verse in Isaiah. This is another thing. Okay, so I'm starting with this John 1, 32. It bothers me. Well, then in my devotions later, I read Isaiah 1, excuse me, Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. And this is read a lot during the Christmas season. And it should be, because it is a prophetic, messianic portion of scripture. And Isaiah pens this. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, talking about the Davidic line, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, talking about the Messiah. But then it goes on to talk about how things are working. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. We got that. John the Baptist got that. He's seen that, that in a dream. It'll rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight, that word delight is referring to uh, uh, our olfactory senses, this idea of smelling something that brings you pleasure, like incense. So there is this, you shall, his delight shall be in the favor of the Lord, in the, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, this idea that when we have this fear of the Lord, it becomes an, uh, an offering, a fragrant offering in the Lord's nose. That is the image Isaiah is communicating here. And he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. He's going to judge with something else helping him make decisions. So I'm sitting there trying to combine John 1, 32, and the Spirit remained on him. And then all those verses we read earlier about Jesus, who he was before, and the things that happened afterwards, and all the things he said about the Spirit, it's all in there in a jumble. And I did that on purpose so your brain could just go a little whacked out. And here is all of this. And so I'm asking myself as, I, as I'm writing in my devotional journal, These things that Isaiah is talking about are just encased with the Spirit. There is character. They're in. They're, they're just him. So when he's with us and in us, they're there like an incense that is burning in your presence. You can't help but smell it. So he lists the word wisdom. Would you like, would I like, would we like biblical wisdom that takes the source of the Bible and connects it with normal human life and understanding how it's supposed to work in our daily life, where the principles of righteous living are put into practice, or maybe one of the things is understanding it enough that we can lead others how to do it. We want that wisdom where you could flip on the switch and say, oh, that makes sense. Well, I can answer for my fine self. Uh, yeah, of course. This is why my brain bounces all over the place. I don't get some of this Practic the practice of what's going on here. How about the understanding the why of life? I don't understand this. How much would you pay for a switch you go and understanding comes? <laughs> how about counsel, the how-to of life? How about might, strength? Let's put it as the word endurance. How much pain can you take and how long can you take it? That's a definition we use around here. Endurance, not giving upness, just being able to walk that long, hard road of obedience with whatever life throws at you. Because once again, boys and girls, this isn't heaven. John the Baptist got 30 some years, Jesus got 30 some years, and life has been turned upside down since the Messiah came. So this idea of might, endurance, how much would I pay for that to be in my life? How about knowledge, which is intimacy with God, where my, my intimacy, this understanding, I don't know, whatever you say, whatever happens, but I know this, that God is real and that he loves me. How about the fear of the Lord with the, with the more antiquated definition of fear, which is an attitude of respect, honor, veneration, reverence. It's a, it's a worshipful word. It ends up going into this maybe a little bit of dread because it's so strange and different that we know we don't understand it all. 
And that's why it's a whoa. But it ends up in this fruit of obedience. How much would you pay for that? What would you do to get that in your life? How about this idea of judging with right judgment, that you're not going to judge with what you see or what, what you hear? You're going to have this core of understanding inside you that says this is it. We read about King Solomon in the Old Testament that he had this amazing gift of understanding and this ability to judge with right judgment. There's examples listed. But how much would we want for John? And it's listed in the Gospel of John again, John 7, 24. Don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. How much, how much is that worth to us? All of this from the Holy Spirit resting upon. So how can the Holy Spirit rest upon me, Pastor O? How can the Holy Spirit rest upon us? What would it be like to receive this supernatural wisdom and understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, obedience, fear of the Lord, respect, however you want to define that one, and, and judging with this right judgment? Maybe we would just want one of those. How much would our life change? The Holy Spirit gave these to Christ, brought them into, it says right there in Isaiah. But my question is, is are they available to me? Are they available to us? So we can stand as he did in this world that isn't heaven? We're still on this topic of still standing. <laughs> the scripture verse that we find in Ephesians 6, 13, and having prepared everything, take your stand. Is the Holy Spirit the key to this preparation? We talked in the prior episode, number four, about confession, this amazing Christian discipline of confession and what, is it, what it does. It is not what you think it is. You're going to have to access that one if you haven't listened to it already. So what, what, what does the Holy Spirit bring into this process of preparation? The ability to stand in this world and make a difference. It's interesting because Paul even writes on this. Paul even brings this up. So this is an Old Testament, New Testament. When we find concepts that go between both, we understand that these are core things. This is part of God's character. This is important. This is a thing, all right? An understanding that we need as human beings. In Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, Paul pens this. <clears throat> that, the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the Spirit, capital S, this personality, this person, of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts wide open, enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. That you will know, K-N-O-W, that you're going to know the hope that he has called you. And what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Talk about retiring and having a great retirement. That what, are, what is our inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? Do you want to understand God's power? Is that something that you're hungry, hungry for? So Pastor Robin, last night I got to this point and I just stood there. I was like, I don't know how to end this thing because I've just walked you through the ping pong exercise that goes in my head when I'm trying to thoroughly understand as much as I can a foundational principle, enough that I can explain it to individuals, and this is as far as I've gotten, and I've loved Jesus since I've been 14, and I'm well past that now. <laughs> and it comes to this conclusion. We need to ask for everything the Holy Spirit has for us, and be prepared to be freaked out and not freaked out, but everything Amen. that he has for us. So you were there last night, Pastor Robin. You mm -hmm. were sitting there while we got to this point, and... We play peekaboo behind the prayer board, you know, showing how we normally treat this stuff. I put my Bible on the floor where the chairs start in the auditorium and walked around this great, big, amazing <laughs> whiteboard. And usually we ask for things or want to see what God is doing from behind a screen because it's a little too freaky. Well, look out from underneath it like we're peeking under a door and watch it from afar. And the Holy Spirit is saying, you don't have to do that. I want you to come stand on this line and I'm going to help you be prepared. But it doesn't make sense. Uh-huh. And that's where we stop. We can't stop there. I mean, you can walk through any ritual you want and say, well, I took care of this. I prayed for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's great. 
How freaked out have you been since then? Who was the last person you prayed for? Who was the last person that you know God told you to go into their messy life and love them? When was the last time you stood up for injustice? When is the last time you knew God was calling you to do something you didn't want to do, and you did it? When was the last time you, f you faced a life hard and it didn't affect your faith, it actually increased it? I mean a really hard one. A really hard one. These are all evidences of the Holy Spirit being in us. Scripture is really clear what he brings. Yeah, speaking in tongues and all that, that is great. It's a real tool. Being able to pray in the Spirit gets you through when your words don't work. Love, love being able to have that as a tool in my supernatural toolbox. But honey, that, that's the screwdriver. Where's the drill? Where's the jackhammer? Where's, where are these other things? Where is the stuff with flame? <laughs> I love the, uh, this was really personal for me because it takes me right back to when I was born again. Um, and this time period after that where I had the opportunity to witness the Holy Spirit working through people's lives, the power of seeing that, and the testimony, you know, we talk about Revelation twelve eleven, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And so watching people around me who love Jesus, who were filled with the Holy Spirit, who were navigating things in really Jesus-loving, God-honoring ways that just puzzled me, it provoked the question, how is that happening in your life? Where is that power coming from? That curiosity of what I see and what I'm hearing through testimony or sharing life or what we witness in reality doesn't look like human capacity. So I like that. What is what is that? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a that, it was a who. Oh, yeah. It was a who. Robin, you need to meet the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's more? Oh my goodness, is there more? And so I love you continue to encourage us to have our devotions, our quiet time, where we get an opportunity to absorb as much of the word as possible and let it rattle our thinking. And, and what it does, it can whet the appetite for more, the more of what Jesus left us. And I, I love how you pointed out that that Jesus, when he said, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. How Jesus didn't leave us hanging. You mentioned he gives us the answer, and that's the Holy Spirit. Yes. And it fits in that category for me, or, or he fits in that category for me of, I don't know how to do brain surgery, but I sure appreciate people who have that skill. I don't know how an engine really works, but I know it does, and... There are people who get that. I don't, there's all kinds of stuff I don't know. But you asked us at the beginning, do we trust Jesus? And in that scripture, John 16, 12 through 14, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And I love the declaration of that. When he comes, which means he was gonna, yep. he will. He will guide you. So if I'm asking, if we're asking, he will, I don't have to judge that with my eyes. I don't have to, I, I have to believe him. I have to believe what it says. Oh, okay. And that growing and recognizing how trustworthy he is, helps me stand. It helps us relax into the Holy Spirit. And so I love that testimony can help us. Watching how he works through your life, watching how he functions through others' lives. And even this morning in my quiet time, thinking about us and the life we get to live, knowing that Jesus has asked us to be standing in situations that we're not necessarily equipped for, according to the human eye, or 
obedience that appears beyond why hey lady why are you standing there oh because jesus told me to and then you watch what the holy spirit can do through that simple obedience because the truth is if we're walking a jesus journey we're way over our head (laughs) oh and getting used to that yes exactly Mm -hmm. and so praise the lord for the gift of the holy spirit because that is our only way to navigate and still stand and provide that here and now. Yes, and amen and preach it, girl. (laughs) (laughs) So where do we go from here? To you and our listening audience, including you, Phyllis, we missed you this week. We will enjoy uh, kissing your beautiful face when you come back after the snow melts. (laughs) So, hey, girl. Hi, Phyllis. Everything that the Spirit has for us comes down to, like you just said, comes down to trust. Do I trust the words of Christ in Scripture? Do I trust the new relationship, burgeoning relationship, or the dating relationship I have with Jesus? Because if you're listening to this podcast, there's something curious going on in you. Do I trust him? It it, it comes down to... Every single person who's ever been on the planet trusting what God is saying, either the pre-Messianic or the post-Messianic, do we trust him? And he is telling us clearly in the New Testament as he's preparing the disciples that he's with you, but he's going to be in you, and it's going to be the thing that changes us to be able to do what Paul is saying, that do everything you can to prepare and then stand. Why in the world would we not want everything that he has for us. So as we close this podcast, I would like to sing you some amazing worship songs to elevate you to this feeling of euphoria, and it doesn't work that way, especially because I cannot sing well. I would like to pray you into heaven so you experience the glories of, and I can't do that because this is a personal thing that you get to wrestle with, not just at the end of this podcast, Every single time you feel the Spirit encounter you in your relationship with Christ. The Spirit draws us to Christ. It is the beginning. It is the beginning of our relationship. He draws us to Christ. But then Jesus says he's going to be in us. There is this amazing Holy Spirit. Go for it. I want everything that you have. It's it's as simple as that. Submitting to all of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But realizing when we do that, it does take trust. And it really helps to have a healthy knowledge of Scripture, which means we should read our Bible on a regular basis. And actually not should we get to, because it is the map. Dora the Explorer, we're going on an adventure. Find the map, find the map. The map is called the Bible in all of this, all right? And it requires trust. Mm -hmm. It requires trying. And it does require some failing because you're not quite sure what to do. It requires definite praying. It does require fellowship, other people you can bounce it off of and practice on. It's nice when you practice. I think the Holy Spirit told me this. What do you think this says? What do you think this means? I feel really compelled, and I can't get this person out of my head. What do you think? My neighbor was this, and I said something, and it was really mad. We got in a really bad argument. But now I feel like I did something really wrong, even though they were at fault. But I think I'm the one who's supposed to. All of these wonderful things... The being Holy Spirit led in relationships and choices and all of this kind of stuff, it is much easier when you are in a fellowship of people who are doing the same thing and you can ask them and you can fail in front of them and you can succeed in front of them and you can build this map, this life that Jesus has for you here on this planet. Who is going to tell you biblical truth in your life? Who's going to reflect it back to you? Asking for everything the Holy Spirit has for you. And then be ready, because there is no adventure like this anywhere else on the planet. Thanks so much for joining in our discussion this week on Still Standing, Week 5, Preparation in the Spirit. Please join us and the whole Wednesday night crew at Maranatha's Forest Lake Campus at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday evenings and enjoy this discussion live. Don't forget, you can check out our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night for all of Pastor Orlean's notes and references. And please feel free to share with your friends. And today, 
wherever we find ourselves. Let's love God and love people. See you for the next episode of Chew On This.